Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Talk Time. Uh, this week, we shall be taking a look at Nkrumah, perhaps the Institute of African Studies, and a festival. Welcome to Talk Time. Hello? Okay, uh, wait a minute. Why? He, my wife, comes and send a message you. Hey, your face is going to move me. Hello? I didn't know what's happening. What's happening? It's a child, my wife, 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 my Family Dwelling Company Limited. Yet to borrow, biofuel, biogas, swimming pool, plumbing works in Yinaso, Yeyebi, Freye, 0240-333-111, and Nasa 0244-144-822. Me and Pa and Anna, you want swimming pool on me feet? Me want to, me want to be here. Family Dwelling, I want to say. Family Dwelling. Go fast, you are not sick. Well, hello and welcome to this edition of Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, we're going to be taking a look at Nkrumah, the Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies, and a festival. And we are particularly privileged to have with us in the studio Professor Amina Mama, who is chair of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies. Prof, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, when we talk about the chair, the Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies, what are we talking about? Well, apparently I'm the fourth chair. Um, I have three predecessors. The last one was uh, Professor Horace Campbell, who's um, a Trinidadian Marxist Pan-Africanist. Um, and the, but going back to the first one was Professor Anyedoho, who's very well known here. He actually founded and uh, uh, the first, ran the first festival. Um, and I believe he was the first chair. So it's his brainchild. Um, to combine the chair, which is a visiting appointment, with um, the hosting of a festival. So when I arrived here, it's one of the things I was asked to do. But it's a 12-month appointment in African studies. And I came because I really wanted the opportunity to get out of the USA, where I currently am a migrant worker, and uh, come and uh, do some work with my colleagues. Uh, Professor Tsikata is a, a colleague and a very old um, associate of mine and um, I thought I might be more useful here than I am in California so I've taken time out to come and work here on the continent which I have sorely missed uh, I was in South Africa for 10 years and from there I went to the US so for me it was an opportunity to reground with my comrades and sisters and uh, offer something in a time that's dire I mean we're sitting here in a pandemic so um, it's foolhardy to move anywhere, but I just thought I'd rather be here than sitting it out over there. Festival. Well, it's called the Kwame Nkrumah Cultural and Intellectual Festival. Uh, this will be the third edition, and this edition will be different. Uh, when I got here, I was invited to organize a festival, and I said, hey, are you kidding me? You're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, but then I thought about it, and because one of the projects that's brought me here in the past is actually a, a one of, I think it's one of the continent's first open access digital journals, I knew a bit about, in fact, we set it up because we see the power of digital culture for decolonial projects, anti-colonial projects. Um, so we sort of bit the bullet of digitalization, and I've been editor of that journal for 20 years. So I knew what was possible, but a festival? So I thought about it, but then thought, wait, you know, because of COVID, the whole world has been living online. WhatsApp, Zoom, and these things have developed exponentially, and certain people have made vast profits off them. But as tools, 
we've got more used to digital engagement. So I thought, okay, we could do a festival that's safe if we can use digital technology. So that was the, the first thing. It's the first time we've ever mounted on anything on this scale that is a digital cultural experience. So um, basically to join it, people just go onto the website www.kwamenkrumahfestival.com and through that portal you access what we've built, which is a totally uh, unique digital infrastructure to host the festival. And we've done that with Pan-African partners in uh, South Africa where they've uh, done a little more in terms of putting on films, performances, music, as well as your uh, talk, talk discussions and dialogues. Mm. So we have a festival which will be mounted across three stages. Um, and it offers intellectual dialogues, cultural performances and displays. Um, right now, what started yesterday is what we call Youth First. It's a youth festival. And I said to the younger people, curate your own. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you what to curate. And we are thrilled with what they did yesterday, are doing today, and will be doing tomorrow. So there's an autonomous digital festival focusing on uh, youth first under the, um, the moniker, Africa is born in us. It's a paraphrase of Nkrumah's Africa is born in me. Mm -hmm. And as you know very well, Nkrumah paid serious attention to the youth. His effort was manifest in the youth brigades, which even then were controversial accused of various things, bringing men and women together. It's in defiance of many of our traditions. But I thought if the youth organize their own festival using their own voice, their artistic talent and creativity, that and the fact that 65% of Africans are under the age of 25, whether we like it or not, the youth are first and they're the future. So that's the first stage of the festival. The other three stages are cultural performances, and intellectual dialogues and uh, there's the opportunity for uh, a vendor market as well not doing too well on that I'm not good at business <laughs> curating business people so that's a bit thin <coughs> but the other part i'm particularly excited about as someone who's been involved in film is the film festival you know the problem as africans we can't access our own cinema and if you're the height of your career is a contract with disney Disney are the same people who took out a, a, a registered a patent on Swahili phrase, Hakuna Matata. If an African now puts Hakuna Matata on a t-shirt, you have to pay Disney. When we wanted to do an exhibition and download pictures of Hanakuja, Getty owned them. We have to pay $500 to borrow a Getty image of someone who lived and worked here. So as you can see, culture is still under globalization and digitalization. The colonial system is intact. The hegemonies are there. So this festival really attempts to undo that and to put our own digital content using our own digital infrastructure and um, reverse, the, reverse the gaze, reverse the flow while addressing the economic aspects of the cultural industries globally. For the, for the intellectual dialogue, what are the issues that are coming up? What are the issues which will be discussed? Okay, it's a bit different from previous dialogues because you know there's a long-term diaspora African dialogue that goes on. It's very, very evident here in Ghana through the homecomings, through the museum projects, through um, a number of things. And I would say many of those are very worthy that the past is very important. It's important that we retrieve and take ownership. Indeed, that's the first step that Sheikh Anta Diop and other great Pan-Africanists um, embarked on with African history. Um, we're a bit different from that with due respect. We are future oriented and that's why we're putting youth first. I would say that the retrieval and the reparations are important, but we need to be engaging with the creative energy of the later generations and the new movements. Since Nkrumah's life um, and legacy, uh, for example, the, the feminism in the title of the festival, there are now women's movements all over Africa. It was something he drew on and encouraged. It now calls itself an African, Pan-African feminist movement. They're not in dialogue 
with the old school Pan-Africanists, although women have always been in that movement. So one of the agendas is to bring these two into dialogue, however, um, however that can be facilitated. The men are organizing, the women are there in the uh, youth movements and so on. The women also have done a huge amount of organizing um, over the last uh, half century. So it was to really, you know, patch those two together. So it's about bringing youth and women to the fore because most Pan-Africanist gatherings foreground the, the brothers and the comrades, bring them together. And to do that, we're leveraging and putting women and youth front and center, hoping that this will uh, lift that up and bring it into more synergy. Um, not necessarily with mainstream politics, but certainly with progressive movements. So the diasporans we're bringing are not, uh, and I won't call the old names, but we're bringing people like Robin Kelly. He's the author, he follows Cedric Robinson and Angela Davis and is a major voice in the articulation of the critique, the theory of racial capitalism and the black radical tradition. So basically I'm saying we're bringing left Pan-Africanist diasporans in. Um, so it's a bit different from just bringing culture. We're bringing those who have pursued Nkrumah's socialist legacy and an anti-racial legacy um, and uh, therefore bringing class, race and gender and generation together in this festival. What about the, the, the whole concept of the unification of Africa? Would well, it find place yeah. in this? In this Very festival? much so. I think the African people need to unite. A lot of the focus has been on the unification of nations and across regions. Now there's talk about the unification of the economy, although I have to say I think they're looking at the corporate elite economy rather than the people's economy. Um, but I think that Africans need to unite across gender, generation, and class, first and foremost. I don't understand that one. Unification along class lines. Yeah, we need a new level of unity so that people, as you know, you must know that the, the pro one of the major problems of Africa is growing inequality. So we have these hyper-elites, the descendants of the old elites and new uh, entrepreneurial um, people, and they are a very different class from the ordinary people and the producers and the producers of, of popular culture. So we're also redefining culture, not in terms of high art and culture, but in terms of, it's Cabralian, Amilka Cabral's definition of culture was the live way of life of the people, starting with agriculture. He was an agronomist. So let's redefine culture in a popular way um, and, re uh, and stop the appropriation and elitization of both culture and the economy. I still don't get the concept of class unity. <laughs> of class unity? Class unity. I mean, are we uniting antagonistic classes or what is class unity Unity about? between, you know, um, if you take the academy, it tends to be separate from movements, okay? Mm -hmm. So the kinds of intellectuals that are coming to this festival, some of, most of them are academics, but they're not all academics. And the issue is that the academy is not enough. Mm -hmm. It remains ivory tower, it remains elite, yet we have people in it who actually want to do more than stay in the ivory tower enjoying their privilege. I count myself among those people and I certainly would account, um, count um, many other people that are involved in this festival mm -hmm. as uh, people who are publicly engaged, who want to support the radical forces in our societies rather than just live in the archives, populating the libraries with beautiful manuscripts that many of us can hardly access. So I mean that kind of uh, alliance, you might call it. Um, I hear you on the antagonism. Yeah, uh, because Nkrumah classes. definitely recognizes that yes. that antagonism. Well, it's worse than ever. It's worse than ever. When the working ever. class wins over the bourgeoisie. Yeah. Well, that is so definitely. So it doesn't there. talk about class unity. No, it well, talks I'm about suggesting... class warfare. Yes, indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. So we've had plenty of warfare, and we mm -hmm. haven't won. So I want to suggest that dialogues might be a way to proceed at this time. 
You think that we can overcome capitalism, capitalist exploitation through dialogue? No, I don't. Not just through dialogue. And the dialogues are about what strategies? How can we organize the economy differently? How can we use the law? Can we use the law as is, as a tool to protect property, intellectual property in <coughs> Africa? Mm -hmm. The law, as you know, is a tool of the ruling classes. Maybe we have to revisit the law and our policies and our state structures and think differently. So the panel on intellectual property brings intellectual property lawyers together to talk about its limits as well as are there possibilities. We raise the question. And if there aren't, for example, intellectual property law focuses on individual property ownership. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but even my discussions with those who are coming to that panel, including um, Betty Moulds, your own former attorney general, are about the fact that um, in Africa, culture is communal. Kente is still not protected because it's a communal cultural good. So we're going to need to change the laws if we want to protect cultural property beyond the level of an individual patent. Are you with me? So, so I'm saying that that, that for example, um, is one of the things we want to look critically at and interrogate in the dialogues. And with the economy, we know that capitalism has not served us. It was built on enslavement. It was built on colonialism. We've all known this for a very long time. But how far have we gone? in terms of trying to redefine the relations of production, the labor contracts, which are written by elite lawyers serving the ruling class. So I think there could be, you know, class war was definitely the model in the 60s, 70s. The Algerian war was fought. The South African liberation war was fought. Interestingly, in West Africa, we didn't have wars, but things are not OK. And even in the countries that fought liberation wars, Things are not okay. So it's not just that talk will help, but talk, you know, action without thought is blind, if I may quote uh, Nkrumah himself. So I want us to think more about our actions, and our actions have to include more than weapons. Who owns all the weapons in the world? Who is dominating global military power? While we are busy fighting wars among ourselves, Who's making the profits? But class war is not about picking up weapons and shooting each other. I hope class it's not just about it. Can, it can involve that. It's an intellectual activity too. It can involve weapons. Um, I prefer it not to because we've seen enough bloodshed. And I'm with class you. Class war is not about bloodshed at all. It should not be. You but know, there has been plenty it's of It's about bloodshed. a struggle of ideas, a competition of ideas. Yes. And so well, essentially, that's what class war is. Which would take the form of dialogue. Well, if you want to put it that way. But so we are in agreement that uh, talking and thinking is another kind of struggle. No, nobody is opposed to talking and thinking. Mm. But classes cannot be reconciled, as Nkrumah states very clearly in class struggle in Africa. They, they cannot be reconciled. Not without substantive change. The given order is class antagonistic, and it depends on the exploitation of poorer classes of people who will continue to get poorer while the rich continue to get richer. Well, we are going to take a short break at this stage and uh, we are in conversation with Professor Amina Mama. Uh, Professor Amina Mama currently is the Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies and she's involved in organizing this festival festival of culture and some intellectual you know activity and so on. Um, the last three days have seen the youth feature prominently in this festival when we come back I like to find out what happened in this festival to the people that Nkrumah loved most short break Mr. Kill, 
Me coco so he. Eni se no no so he e no. E tra. Se ti ta ma ya one me ye. Enu ani da o me bu se se mi so me yo ba. Mr. Q. Mr. Q. Hey come come. I do. Yeah. I don't let. Eni se me ti. Mr. Q. Mr. Kill, 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 Festival, festival which has many dimensions, a youth dimension, intellectual dimension, and a cultural dimension, and they're trying to bring it all together. But it is digital. That's where my next question is. It is. Digital. In this pandemic, was it not possible to bring in the people that I say in Krumah love most? They're underprivileged people the people without access to the digital world, mm -hmm. the people who cannot read and write and so on. How do they feature in this festival? You're absolutely right. Digital inequality is one of the challenges we have, just as we have educational inequality and wealth inequality. And I would say that it's extremely hard Firstly, because the festival is coming off a campus, which, as you know, is an elite, exclusive space. And secondly, because digitalization is unequal. So we're dealing with two challenges there. And we've tried to do it in a couple of humble ways. I don't say we've succeeded, because as I said, there are structural limitations that we face. So um, I know that one of the panels, uh, we're having uh, several discussions on um, cooperatives, and we've brought people from worker cooperatives to present on one round table, um, which will be convened by Adote Bing, who's uh, involved in, he's a, a, I would say, a left economist, and um, it's one of his areas of, of work. So we've got representatives of several co ops coming to share their experience because you know how have they organized is it working better for the workers in those enterprises or not so we want to inform people by sharing actual practical examples um, another way is that we were having sessions on trade which will critique uh, trade policy and look critically at the current African free trade uh, African community free trade agreement uh, there's a session on that which brings together people from um, uh, NAWI. It's uh, an association of uh, African women economists. They've sent two speakers to discuss that at the policy level, but these are intellectuals. Um, we've also got uh, a roundtable curating women from small and medium enterprises to share how they struggle to do their business at the current time. Um, where the competition of you know external people coming and buying up all the sheer butter compromises those who started trying to process mm -hmm. and add value to local products with a view to building livelihoods. They're in unfair competition, frankly. And the, even just a little I've heard from them said, gosh, we have to have a panel on this. You come, you're entrepreneurial, you're starting from zero and trying to build up small businesses. Um, so we have a panel on that. Um, and the other one that's quite exciting, I think, given the history of Ghana, as I'm learning about it, is um, a panel on um, bringing women from the market, from Makola market, into a discussion about their own livelihood experiences. So we hope to share the experiences of people from across, as much to the extent that we can, across the class spectrum and uh, engage, engage with that so that, uh, in a way, without those sessions, it could just be an academic talk shop. So we're trying to bring the real. That's most obvious, though, in terms of the real that, uh, of cultural production. What kinds of uh, production are our creatives doing? And we're showcasing that. And you'll see that creatives are often very critical. So we are curating performances by some kind of different 
people I can think of one is a Togolese have you ever heard the idea of a Togolese heavy metal band no no there's one called Arkan Asrafoko mm. they're performing they've done a, curated their own special performance celebrating Nkrumah um, and rock the the uh, that main, main 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 person I've seen perform on front stage um, sends his message their message is clearly pan-african and clearly militant and they managed to blend the sound of you know a Hendrix electric guitar with a uh, traditional instruments and invoke the ancient traditions That's of, awful. of warriors it's a, noisy a, it's bl loud. a blend of Hendrix and traditional African uh, can you believe it awful. well if you if you visit I've learned here at the musical archives that some of the finest national music came out of Professor Nketiah's work, where he would blend a little bit classical music with traditional music. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be willing to listen to the culture and see and consider the cultural performances that push the edges. Um, well, you may or may not like it. There's a wide variety of things. Some will be more amenable to your conventional African taste than others. That one, I'm pulling it out because it is so different. And because they're ardent Pan-Africanists, and they are a protest band. We also have someone from um, Ar Ar Albert Chimedza from the Mbira Center mm -hmm. in uh, Zimbabwe. Now, he's quite interesting because he is insisting that why should it be the piano and the guitar? The Mbira is our instrument, and he's adding value to it. He runs a business that now probably is the best known producer of Mbiras worldwide. And uh, I don't think the Chinese copies can compete because he builds high quality Mbiras and markets them globally. And they also make music, he's also a musician. So he's an example of, I would say, an African cultural producer who's been very successful in lifting up an instrument that would be as marginal as any other traditional instrument had they not decided to make it um, a plank of national culture and lift it up in the way that he's done. What, what went into the selection of, well, of, of, of performers? You may Musicians, well Musicians, academics, whatever. What you went well into ask. the selection? Well, the concept for the festival, so we're looking for African. We're looking for African that pushes the boundaries that's on the creative fringes of things that we define as African. Because there's too much discourse saying, this is not African, that is not African. But what a young uh, tout is doing with his mobile phone is an African use of digital culture. So it's a capacious view saying, let's see, let's open it up. It's not just about the pyramids, great as they may have been, slaves built them. You know, they're still magnificent, but what were the relations of production? You know, where were men and women in that? It's hard to know. It's so long ago. But I do think we can look at the relations of production today and see what women are doing in fashion, uh, where they're drawing their inspiration from, and try to inform it with um, local sources, local resources, and indeed cultivate new desires and appetites. Um, look at the hair industry. Even the natural hair industry got commodified very quickly. So what's natural hair is not natural hair, you know that. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Let's, let's talk about it, but also talk about how a natural hair movement, which came out of the 60s, black power, black is beautiful, then everyone's wearing wigs and extensions, then you have a natural hair movement, but now the natural hair movement is selling goods that um, may look natural. You know, so the, the appro that's appropriation and simulation for profit. So let, let's take, a, take it in our own hands and decide what we want, how we want to be. So it's about contemporary culture, is what I'm saying, and uh, the possibilities for making future businesses that profit us. And uh, everyone who thinks a successful business means selling to the West is responding to the fact that our local market does not necessarily want to consume African projects. That is a question of education and appreciation and overcoming the globalization that says that uh, this is what is of value and this is not. So we need to change those things.
You mentioned uh, Alote being as one of the, of the participants before. Yeah, he was so, in the pan. We had a Pan African Advisory Committee, which she so, was on. But are mm -hmm. all the performers like Alote being? Alote? Uh, no, the, no. The, so, the, so what the is it that came... went into yeah. selecting, yeah. you know, performers? And when I talk about yes, performers, sure, sure. it includes those who are giving lectures, yeah, yeah. those who are musicians and so on. So what two, went two into things selecting went that? into it. As I, I began with the concept and then went off without coming back to your question. So thank you for uh, correcting my course. No. Yeah, we had uh, two, two sets, two think tanks, if you like. We had a, a local organizing committee, which is drawn out of the Institute of African Studies and whoever else that was formed by the director and is chaired by Dr. Deborah Atobra at the IAS. So that's the local think tank and implementation, they call themselves implementation committee to make sure it happens. Um, but of course, no one had done a digital festival before. The other main, uh, and I would say the intellectual resource was drawn from a Pan-African organizing committee who we convened and consulted. That had about 18 members on it, and I can give you their names if you like. They included um, Carol Boyce Davis, who's done a lot of work. She's in the field of literature. Um, Trinidadian has done a lot of work on African literature and been involved in a number of Pan-African cultural projects. We had uh, uh, Maxine Craig, who happens to be from University of California, Davis, she did a wonderful book years ago called Ain't I a Beauty Queen? And it's about how black women in the diaspora engage with racism and redefine themselves as beautiful. They did so through pageants, um, initially black beauty pageants. So it was kind of copying, but trying to nonetheless say, look, black women are beautiful. She's uh, from a, an old uh, communist family in Bed-Stuyvesant in New York. She even knew Claudia Jones. So why Carol, one, there's a panel, don't let me run to it, but we have a whole panel on left biographies, including Barbara Ransby, Carol Boyce Davis, Eleanor Sisulu, who did the Tambo's biography, and Annette um, Gabriel Joseph, who's done biographical research on all the Francophone women activists of the last century. Um, who else was on that committee? Fatima Alu in Zanzibar, who's a well-known uh, media activist they founded years ago, um, during Nyerere's time, the Tanzania, Tanzania Media Women's Association. Um, we had uh, someone called Sandra Manuel from Mozambique, who's again a long-standing associate involved in the um, feminist Africa community. We had the keynote speaker from yesterday, it was a Mozambican activist called Nyelete Honwana. Um, she and her co comrades founded an organization called Global Black Youth, and they had experience of a massive Global Black Youth Digital Festival last year. So we brought her on board to help and support the youth committee. Um, so she, she gave a resounding keynote yesterday on the situation of black youth, on the challenges of organizing black youth. Um, so there were all of them. I mentioned Adote Bing, Ni Kwate Owu was sure. also on that committee. Um, but it was mostly diasporans and other Africans. Mshai Malonga from Mangola, from Kenya, um, who's uh, very well known for her work on storytelling and as a performance artist. So we tried to have East, West, South. We didn't do too well on North, but nonetheless, the festival does include uh, a small number of North Africans um, who are coming to some of the discussions. Well, viewers, we're going to take another short break. And uh, when we come back, I like to look at the, at the end of the festival, if there'll be anything like the end, you know. But I like to look at the end of the festival. And really, when it comes to an end, what should be our expectation? Short break.
Hello and welcome back to Talk Time and we are in a conversation with Professor Amina Mama who is Chair of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies and she is at the center of the organization of the Nkrumah Festival which has many dimensions and I'd like to find out from her what should be our expectation? All of this festival, intellectual discussions, music, and so on, what should it lead to? Well, the final day of the festival embraces that question. Um, and it's a series of, uh, let's call them forward thinking, forward planning sessions. Mm -hmm. We have facilitators who will engage in open discussion regarding uh, future projects, future plans. Um, one of those involves the Nketia archive, uh, the head Judith Oboku Wateng, um, and uh, um, uh, a brother called Nathaniel Moore, who works at the Freedom Archives in the Bay Area. And this is again digital archiving we're going to be talking about because there are conventional archives which the recent uh, burning of the African archive at UCT including ancient texts, the first uh, Zulu dictionary, for example. These losses, we can avoid them. Our places are insecure, and then there's climatic things, so digital archiving. So they will talk about the possibilities, and they're joined by an African-American historian, last-minute edition, uh, Jessica Millward, who um, also, so the three of them are all sort of ex bring very different kinds of expertise. The Freedom Archive is the archive that the American state did not want. So they have a, an archive of all the U.S.'s overseas adventures and uh, Pan-African movements um, and radical, it's a radical archive of movements. That's different from your conventional academic archive. So I thought it would be very interesting to open up the possibilities of, I'm interested in a people's archive for Africa, an archive of the present. But let's see where the discussion goes and who else is interested in that kind of initiative. Um, there is also a session on the future of the co building the future cooperative economy in Africa. We have people from Uganda, the Uhuru Institute, which is a, a supporter of all the co-ops across East and Southern Africa, um, meeting um, with people involved in cooperatives here. One, Adote Hoffman and Adote Bing, will meet with the two East Africans, the Okellos, to discuss the p possibilities for a pan-African cooperative building uh, movement, and so on. And um, to, to, to bring together the cultural performances, we have a South African performer extraordinaire, who you should not miss. Her name is Tina Schlope. I have to pronounce it with care. But yes. she's an amazing storyteller, performer, filmmaker. In fact, the, the be night before the festival, Saturday night, we're screening a film, a remarkable film in which she's featured. She's the storyteller. It's a film called Liana, which combines animation and all different strategies. So you see, digitalization has already got into cinema. Um, but she's going to do a summation um, on the theme of you know, the radical future of Pan-African culture. So we, have a, so we try to keep the synergy all the time between what's being done on the cultural stages and what's being done in the intellectual dialogue. So the culture's not on the side, it's part of the dialogues. Um, but on the final day, there's a final panel and a closing speaker. The final panel is um, about developing, I can't remember the exact title now, but it's about developing a future of radical black and pan-African thoughts. So we have, um, uh, and then we have a final keynote speaker, who's uh, Akwasi Edu, who's a well-known Pan-Africanist thinker, poet, philanthropist, who's done a great deal. He's famous here for founding Trust Africa. He really does get it. He's both culturally um, accomplished and literate, and he understands the money issue. His strategy has been the philanthropic one, which you know has its own. Uh, it, it has its place, as do some of our backers, the African Women's Development Fund. These are organizations that try and mobilize money for African 
grassroots projects and movements. So um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, last minute, short notice, uh, Akwasi Edu has agreed to do the final closing. So um, we hope to end with final planning sessions with a very powerful cultural performance and uh, uh, a radical panel projecting into the future and then a closing speaker. So that's what will be on the final day. Now here we have Nkrumah, mm -hmm. whose dream is about United Africa and socialism. Mm. Now, all of this, how does that propel us towards that dream? Well, first of all, we do have to have a dream. Uh, Robin Kelly, one of our speakers, is the author of a book called Freedom Dream. It's a beautiful book, uh, mostly about the African-American dreams of freedom despite slavery, despite racism, lynching, all of that. So he's definitely a visionary um, and a future dreamer. And I think many of those here share that dream. As I said, we didn't just bring all the old school Pan-Africanists, because some of them are, you know, want the past back. You know, and Some of us are not too keen on the feudalistic past or the recent hyper-capitalist past and present. So I would say that definitely the thrust of this festival is to really lift up left-wing Pan-Africanism. Let me just spit it out. We're bringing socialist feminist panels on left biography, panels on alternative economic organizing coming from left economists. And you know, the, so the thrust of it, and indeed the performers are, I would say, mostly quite revolutionary. I didn't choose all of them, and some of them are unknown to me. But if the panel, um, the, the two committees, got the gist of the concept and uh, what uh, has been curated, then definitely that's one of the things that I would like to say distinguishes this festival. It is unashamedly embracing critiques of neoliberal capitalism. It is unashamedly embracing Africa's feminist movements, and it is unashamedly foregrounding the youth, the oldest generation of humankind, the majority of the continent. We need to be engaged with them. So I wouldn't say it's, we can't dump on the youth, but we do have to be in transgenerational solidarity with the youth. So. Well, we are going to take a final break. And when we come back from the break, I'm going to ask a question which would not be too comfortable for many people. Here we are in Ghana mm, at the Institute of African Studies dedicating a festival to Nkrumah when the official government position is to denigrate Nkrumah, rewrite the history of the African struggle and so on. How do we manage this tax in this atmosphere. Short break. Hello? Okay, uh, what's your Why? He, my wife, comes and I send a message you. You have to on my phone. Hello? What's happened? It's a child who be a quiet quiet. Say what? Idea sir. We sign for a friend. I'm so used to. Uh huh. Who has not sent messages here? I'm not I'm so tired. 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 Biogas, swimming pool, plumbing works in Yenaso, Yeyebi, Freye, 0240-333-111, Anase, 0244-144-822. Mi am pa anene, mi wo swimming pool mi fi, mi wo zuo, mi wo bibi a yi, family drilling mi gawate, family drilling! Go fashi si anase! Mi awun tuwe, da, jye! Welcome back to Talk Time. And we are talking about the Nkrumah Festival. And we are talking with Professor Amina Mama, who is at the center of organizing this, this, this festival. 
and uh, this is the comfort. This, this, this is the question which is a bit uncomfortable for many people. But professor, please, this may not be comfortable for somebody like you. Yeah, you are organizing this festival in Ghana. Yes. When the government of Ghana is so busily rewriting history in order to demonize Nkrumah. Have you had any difficulties? Do you expect any difficulties? How are you navigating this, this very turbulent <laughs> you know, situation? I'll take that as a warning. <laughs> I'm not brought here by the government or to fight with the government of Ghana. And, and this is where we have to say it's useful to have ivory towers. It's useful to have universities. Um, they are public institutions, but there's a certain degree of latitude. So I'm hired as a visiting professor. I happen to be from Nigeria, um, but I'm hired on a short term to come and contribute what I can to this environment. Um, I have no direct connection to, to help your build government. A legacy. Yes, yes. Which officials are not too happy about. Well, I don't know. I haven't heard from officials. <laughs> they haven't come after me yet. And um, if they did, um, they would have to, you know, we'd have to, they'd have to discuss with the Institute of African Studies. This is not a new festival. It's been there. This is the third edition. It's digital. It's more international. And as I said, it's foregrounding women, youth, culture, and the economy. Um, I haven't heard from the government. I hope that uh, they would uh, not find it necessary to, to, to contact me, because as I said, I'm a guest here, so my, I'm not interested in, in engaging with the political powers that be in any particular context, in any particular moment because I'm a you know, professional academic and intellectual, and we like to take a long view and a big view. And we do know that governments have uh, power um, as a core concern, and we know that governments will do what governments will do. And I don't think the government of Ghana is different from the government of Nigeria or the government of the United States. It may be slightly better than some governments, and is definitely, um, not yet Uhuru. Not yet Uhuru. Now, Prof, again, coming back to the end, what would make you feel that you have been successful? What are the ingredients of success? For me, that's a very good question. Certainly, I'm looking at uh, interest levels. And as I said, we've got, uh, I think we're coming up to 2,000 registrations online. But we know that that doesn't mean presence and engagement. That's data. We like the data, but it has its limitations. I'm looking for the richness of the discussions. I'm looking for people to share their inspirations. I'm looking to learn. Uh, we've put this thing together to learn and teach one another. And as I said, it's a festival. The power of it is it should be popular. It should be beyond the university. It's free. It's open access. Anybody who registers can get into it. And so far, the majority of the registrations are from the continent. So I consider that a success. Because with digitalization, you have to deal with the fact that the external, ex the centrifugal forces might have led to it being all foreigners. No, majority are on African. That's because of the way um, Dr. Eric uh, Lawe has done the publicity. We've done it locally, continentally, um, so you know that, that's great. It will get out there. Um, but so we look at that, but I will really look to the future. I would want a festival like this to set a tone, to stimulate everybody who gets online and joins in with it, and to produce lots and lots of new ideas and new cultural innovations, new levels of uh, people who want to own their own businesses and now know that it's actually possible um, for people to own their labor, own their livelihoods. I mean, we're seeing this. People are left to fend for themselves. The state is not providing. The foreign investors are not providing. So people here are already making their own livelihoods. So let's find ways of 
coalescing that, bringing it together and lifting it up and valuing it and strengthening it. I kid you not. So I hope that uh, people will benefit from ideas, from cultural inspiration, and anything to lift us out of the malaise of isolation and lockdown. And the last uh, year has been probably one of the most difficult because we are a social people. To be locked down in our separate spaces has done damage. I hope this festival can reckon with that in a practical way by in stimulating and inspiring and, and, and developing, pushing the p possibilities of remaining social and socializing and remaining inspired even in the digital sphere. Which I used to hate, but hey, we have no, we fought it, but it's here. So what can we do? We have to try and turn it to our purpose, just as we want to turn culture and the brilliance, uh, what Nkrumah called African genius. We want to turn it to our purpose. Uh, Prof, thanks very much for coming. Thank you very, thank you thank very, you very, very much. much. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. For, thank for, you for, for your, uh, uh, you don't pull your punches. I like the way you've interviewed. Oh. And I've enjoyed our discussion very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, viewers, we were in a conversation with Professor Amina Mama. Who is a visiting professor at the Institute of African Studies? Really, she's occupying the Kwame Nkrumah chair at the Institute. And she's at the center of organizing this Nkrumah Festival. Uh, we wish them the best. Before we pull down the curtains, please take this advice from me keep your dial on Pan African television. If you keep your dial on Pan-African television, you'll be joining 46 other African countries and enjoying what we put out. And we put out the best in news, best in current affairs, best in entertainment, best in sports, best in everything. Please keep your dial on Pan-African television until we meet again next week. Until then, it's goodbye from the director of the show, Adam Lumo from the producer, George, from cameraman, from all of us at Pan-African Television. Goodbye until we meet again next week. Bye-bye.